Father, we want to thank you. We want to thank you for everyone that have uh, Zoom in today. And let the ears be open, the eyes of understanding be enlightened to be able to receive what is the word of God that is revealing to us. Uh, we we thank you. Spirit of wisdom, knowledge, Amen. Amen. And Lord, we commit this uh, hour into your hands. In Yeshua's name, and everyone says, Amen. Amen. And amen. All right. Um, the agenda for this uh, session will be in three areas. I want to talk about uh, chiasm uh, in scripture. I'll explain to you what chiasm means. And uh, also uh, Revelation 12. We're going to focus on Revelation 12. And the reason why we want to focus on Revelation 12. And then also to take you through to some of the new discovery about the fig tree prophecies. So let's zoom in now. Now, what is chiasms in scripture? Now, chiasm refers to a sequence of elements or sentence or a verse or a paragraph or a chapter or even book that have repeated and then developed. And then after that, it is in the reverse order. Now, this may sound a bit jumbled up, but uh, a few illustrations will make it much clearer. Let's look at John 4, 23 as an example. Now, John 4, uh, 23 and also to 24, uh, it says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now let me uh, break this down for you on and develop this, uh, what it means by chiasms. All right. So here we look at it as the first part. The first part talk about the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipper shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. Now this is uh, the first thing that talk about worshipper worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And you notice that at the last part of uh, verse 24, it also appear worship him in spirit and in truth. All right, it's just like what we talk about, you know, cascading down from center all the way down to the center. Just like what in the past I talk about uh, the Russian doll, the way we study scripture. It, it tells you the whole story and then encapsulate into it further and further down and then give you the climax right in the middle. All right, so here in these two verses, you have uh, one talking about worshiping the Father in spirit and truth at the beginning of verse 23 and ending with the same uh, topic or the same sense on uh, verse 24, the last part. And then the second part of uh, verse 23 talk about, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. So the word is worship him. And you find it repeated again in verse 24. And then the center, stream, uh, the, the center theme is God is a spirit. So you can see the beauty of this structure, right? You have uh, two verses, the beginning of the one verse and the ending of the second verse is the same thing. They talk about the same thing. And then cascading down to the middle one, which is talking about worship him, repeated in uh, verse 23, the second part, and then verse 24, the second part. And then the actual theme of these two verses is the one in the center, which is God is a spirit. So here, when we analyze scripture, these two verses, we know that the focal point, the important point that we need to focus in these two verses is God is a spirit and we need to worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, how beautiful is this structure? And you see that repeated over and over again in scripture. So today I want to introduce to you, whenever you read the scripture, look out for such symmetries, you know. And then when you look at the, such symmetry, then you know what the word tells you that the center point is the main punchline that we need to catch it. So in this verse here, these two verses here, God is a spirit, is the center or central theme. All right, isn't that beautiful? Now this is also repeated uh, also in terms of books. Now you read Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 talks about the tree of life. Now when you flip all the way back to the end of the Bible, again in Revelation 22, again refers to the tree of life. So here you have uh, this in a macro sense uh, in terms of books, Genesis, and then Revelation, both zooming in on the theme of the tree of life. Amen. Hallelujah. And then also Exodus, huh? Exodus, the book of Exodus, during Pentecost when Moses arrived at Mount Sinai. All right. And then he brought the law down and the, the Israelites were worshipping uh, a, a golden calf. Right. And then, you know, 
God was so angry that 3,000 died. All right, so when you look at Exodus, then you compare that with Acts also on Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit came. In Exodus, Pentecost, the law came. All right, because uh, that is the, um, the, the period of law, or the, pen, uh, of the, uh, the, the dispensation of law. But when the book of Acts comes, it's the dispensation of grace. So in the same time, Pentecost on the same day, first 3,000 died, and then in the book of Acts, in the uh, dispensation of grace, 3,000 were saved. So you see the symmetry again. Now, I want to develop this a bit more further, and then you can understand why this afternoon we would like to focus on chapter 12 of the book of Revelation. Let's zoom in in the book of Revelation. I'm getting excited when I when I beginning to discover this pattern, you know. And, God is so clever. Yeah, and this is no different from what I've been teaching about using the analogy of the Russian doll. You remember that? The Russian doll comes up with a big mama, you open up another smaller doll and a smaller doll, and then in the middle there's a small doll, which is actually the climax of the book of Revelation. So here let's go uh, with me to the book of Revelation. So here, the beauty of God's structure. Now, the book of Revelation in the chapter 1, verse 1 to 20, is actually the prologue, the introduction, telling you about Jesus, right? He comes in uh, among the seven lampstands. So it's a prologue, it's an introduction to this wonderful book. And then when you look at the last chapter, which is chapter 22, it's an epilogue. Is the ending part, right? The ending part, and then Jesus said, I'm coming back soon. <laughs> I'm coming back soon. All right, so, and now we're going to cascade it into the middle. So we started off by the first chapter, prologue, the intro, and then with the epilogue on the 22nd chapter, and they actually basically give you the introduction and the conclusion. And now we're going to zoom in into the other chapters that unfolds. Then you have the seven letters, of course, right? Which is uh, chapter 2, verse 1, to chapter 3, verse 22. And then at the bottom, from the end coming to the center, we have seven angels talking about Babylon and the new Jerusalem, right? Uh, Babylon will be destroyed. And it's also uh, depicted by the seven angels versus the seven letters. And then zooming in, we have the seven seals. And then from the other side, we have the uh, seven bowls. Now, you just see the symmetry, right? It is getting excited, exciting because it's coming to a climax. And then we have 144,000 saints in chapter 7. And then uh, coming in from the, the other end, we have 144,000 saints and the seven angels. You see the symmetry? It's so beautiful. So when you really look at the book of Revelation, and when you look at the chapters in this context, you get excited because God is a God of form and is a God of structure. So it is so beautiful that when we look at scripture, I, I can never, I can never finish understanding and reading and getting excited about every time when we read scripture, we get new discovery. And then you have the two witnesses and then the two beasts. All right, now I got run out of space, so I go on to the next slide. All right, the two witnesses and the two beasts, and then here we have the women clothed in the sun, which is chapter 12, verse 1. Listen to that. And then here we have the woman's seed that keep the commandment of God. Also, now you see focusing everything on chapter 12. The dragon in heaven and the dragon that persecute the women on earth. And then you have the woman that flees into the wilderness and the woman also flee to the wilderness with different verses. One is verse 6 and one is 15. And at the middle, we have the climax. <laughs> That's why Satan, as Satan, really hate this book of Revelation because the climax there, they're telling you, it is Revelation 12.12, 12, Satan is cast out. Wow, cast 12. down from heaven. It's yeah. it's so wonderful. Aren't you excited? I'm really excited. You know, when we look at how scripture comes in, and now we know that the central theme in the book of Revelation is not only just for the the bride that has been with the Lord, but the central theme is that we have no fear because we are the victor and not the victim. We are above and not beneath. And the central theme, that's why Satan hate this book. That's why Satan came and confused us on not understanding this book. Satan come and tell the churches, don't study this book because it is so difficult to understand. Because the central theme in the whole book of Revelation 
not only just for the bride to be with Yeshua, but the central theme is our enemy is defeated. It's cast out of heavens. Hallelujah. Yes, darling. And also in uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, it said, Blessed are those who, what, read and what? Do. <laughs> no, read and heed the word oh. of the prophecy. Yeah. Read here and heed the word of the prophecy. Because in that time, the scriptures, we, they are not so blessed that you can just pay some money and buy a Bible. Okay? And that time is only the priest who has the, only the Old Testament dur during the Jesus day. Okay? Only the, the priests and the scribe and the Pharisees, they are educated, they can read. Okay? That's why God tell us, God told us through the Book of Revelation, if you read, that's why you need someone to read to you during that time, and, and then, then hear. hear. Mm -hmm. Okay, after people read, you hear, and, and then, then you hear. That means you do what is inside yeah. the prophecy. Yeah. Then you will be blessed. So I believe all of you that zoom in, and all of you <laughs> that has been studying this book, you'll be blessed. Amen. And also those that have not uh, do a detailed study, I would encourage you to do the study because this is the only book of the 66 book in the Bible that tells you, you will be blessed when you, yeah. when you read, when you hear, and you heed the word of the prophecy. Just let's listen to God's word and let me read to you what uh, uh, Christine has just shared in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the word of this prophecy. And keep those things which are written in it. For what? The time, the time is, is near. near. So, and we are now, according to uh, Prophet Robert Mawari, which has warned us and told us many times, the last, uh, first three, three uh, 5781, that was on the 18th of September last year, 2020. We have started the last year of the 70 week. That means we are now into the 70th year of Daniel timeline. So time is short. So we need to work while it's still day, for night is coming that no one can work. That is why we have this session to forewarn all the beautiful bride of Christ to get ready because your wedding supper is coming yeah. and Yeshua is coming for his beautiful bride <laughs> and uh, holy and without blemish. Amen. 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 So here the beauty of God's structure is really immense and uh, how can we not fall in love with the word? You know that uh, you know, each time I, I study the word and I tell myself how I wish someone when I was into reading the word of God and when I first became a believer, someone just point out to me and then my learning curve would be so much more sharper. So here for those of you who have uh, really delved into the word of God recently, you know, it's going to be a real treat because you have uh, myself and my wife and so many other teachers they are pointing to you the beauty of God's structure among all those things that he tells us. Amen. Amen. So in this way, I want to point out the key points in the book of Revelation. Uh, we're going to ask such question, and I know some of you already know the answer, but nevertheless, let's go in and delve into it. Who is the woman that mentioned in Revelation 12? Who is this man child? Who is the dragon? What, is, what does it mean, the third of the stars of heaven uh, that has uh, fallen down? And uh, we will notice that we will face increasing warfare and deceptions. Now all of us are very familiar with fake news. Uh, place of refuge in the wilderness for three and a half years that Prophet Robert is talking about. So these are the key points that I'd like to, uh, to focus on as we delve into the book, uh, chapter 12 of the book of Revelation. Right, chapter 12, the
the book of Revelation, in verse 1, it says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and on her head guarded of twelve stars. Now over here, some of these scholars in the past think that this is the church. All right, and I don't think this denotes the church because the church did not give birth to the man child, which is, I believe, Yeshua. And now the symptom is very clear at who this woman is. Because if you will refer to Genesis uh, 37, verse 9, that talks about Joseph <laughs> and his dreams, all right, about the, about the seven fat cow, you know, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, the seven lean cows. And, and then he also dreamed that uh, the sun and moon and the, uh, and the 12 stars you know, will bow down to him. Right? So uh, the father was very upset with him. But uh, this really shows you yeah, that uh, father, which is then called uh, Jacob, when his name was uh, changed to Israel. So here we know that this woman that clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, um, and uh, this is none other than Israel. All right, then verse 2 says, Then begin with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. All right, here we have this wonderful uh, imagery of uh, Yeshua, baby Yeshua in a manger. And here, this uh, picture depicts correctly that the shepherd are the first ones to come and to worship the King of Kings. Unlike in many of the nativity story, we have the shepherd, we have the three wise men, uh, all together, you know, which is uh, not correct. So this image, uh, this uh, picture is uh, more accurate because it shows you only the shepherd, the low of the lowest people in uh, society are the one that was so blessed to be able to be the first to come and worship baby Yeshua. So here, let's move on to verse 3. And uh, verse 3, And another sign appears in heaven. Behold, a great fear, fiery red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diantems on his head. And his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven. Now, these stars of heaven, we use scripture to interpret scripture. And in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 1, uh, Jesus was actually pointed towards that the stars are actually referring to angels, the angels of the church. Now, let me refer to uh, Revelation chapter 1, uh, verse 20, the last verse of this uh, wonderful chapter in Revelation 1. The mystery of the seven stars, and this is in red print, uh, which is uh, Yeshua's word. The mystery of the seven star which you saw in my right hand, that means Yeshua's right hand, and the seven golden lamps stand. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lamps stand which you saw are the seven churches. So here scripture, interpret scripture, we now know very clearly that the stars of heaven is not physical comet that we are looking at, all right? Uh, even though there might be some truth to it, but the stars here in scripture refers to the angels. And in this particular context, it's the fallen angels, right? And um, here, he still drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devolve her child as soon as it was born. So here we know at the time where Yeshua was born, one third of the demonic forces, one third of the demonic or the fallen angels are already deployed on earth. And that's why, you know, since then, the kingdom suffer violence, you know, and the violence would have to take it by force. This right. violence is the passionate people like you and I are going to take the kingdom by force because the kingdom suffer violence. Why is it so? Because the king of kings was declared uh, when he was on the cross that he is the king of the Jews, and therefore his Amen. kingdom was henceforth declared. And because of this, this scripture basically refers to the point that at Jesus' birth, one third of the fallen angels are cast down onto earth and to create such confusion and wickedness increases. And now we know that we are not fighting with uh, just flesh, uh, and blood. Blood, uh, flesh and blood, but we are fighting in the heavens, into the principalities, into the uh, spiritual realm. All right, so... Do not uh, take this lightly because the spirit realm is very real. 
And I just pray right now for those who listen in that our spiritual eyes of understanding will be enlightened, that we will begin to understand the truth and that our spiritual eyes will be able to see into the spiritual realm and to contend against the evil forces because what we see is how we can pray and pray it in a very focused way. So here, the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth. Now, this is the case whereby uh, Yeshua was uh, being born. Verse 5, uh, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Now, again, this is a very strong reference to that this male child is none other than our Lord Yeshua. How do we know? Again, using the principle of uh, you know, scripture, interpreting scripture. In Revelation 19, uh, 15, uh, let me turn that verse and I'll read out to you. It's talking about the return of Yeshua. And uh, he comes in uh, back as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So Revelation 19, 15, let me read. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. With it, he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. And he himself tread the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his tie a name written, King of Kings and King Lord of, God, of, God. of Lords. So here, this scripture in Revelation uh, 19 confirm that this male child, you know, which will rule the nation with the rod of iron is none other than the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, which is our Lord Yeshua. So here I'm teaching you a way that when you read the word and you want to be very confident in your inferences or your understanding, always use scripture to interpret scripture. And we also have this uh, very important principle called the uh, principle of first mention. Whenever a scripture or a terminology or a name that was first mentioned in the Bible, that is an important understanding that we need to commit to memory. Mm -hmm. So every time when we see the same word or the same name, we always refer back to the principle of first mention. And that's where the true meaning stands. All right. So here, then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God and they should feed her there 1,260 days. Now, 1,260 days is literally days. Uh, if you convert them into years and the Hebraic year is 360 days to a year. So you divide by 360 days out of 1,260 days, you would get exactly three and a half years, which is the midpoint of the seven years that we talk about as the years of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation period. All right, verse seven. And the war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angel fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angel fought. Verse eight, but they did not prevail, hallelujah nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil and the Satan, who deceived the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Hallelujah. So here we have this wonderful verse that the dragon was cast out, and um, there was this big uh, battle in the heavenlies and Michael the archangel all right and particularly Michael as the archangel is the angel that guards over Israel right Israel is so important to our Abba father that he uses one of his mighty angels uh, Michael and designate him to be in charge of the protection of his firstborn which is the nation of Israel so here uh, the angels uh, uh, under the charge of Michael fought with the dragon and his host of uh, demons and fallen angels, and they were found not, and they were cast out. So here we know that uh, they are cast out into earth, and henceforth, we know when this happens, all right, there will be great uh, turmoil on earth. So meanwhile now, we know that only one third of the fallen angels were down on earth where Yeshua was born. There are still two thirds circulating in the second heaven. The second heaven is a cosmos, you know, uh, where the stars and the galaxies are. And the third heaven is beyond that. 
where the throne room of God resides. And devil, uh, the dragon resides in the second heaven and uh, he is now not allowed even on the second heaven and he, has, he will be cast out, cast down to the earth. And that is where the woes begin to start. And that's where uh, he will persecute God's people. Let's look at verse 9. Uh, here, before we move on to verse 9, I'd like to refer to uh, uh, the scripture of Luke chapter 10. And uh, this was the chapter where Yeshua sent out the 70s uh, to go into the towns to... Uh, to preach the gospel of the kingdom. So when the 70 returned, they were so joyful and they told Yeshua, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So it's so important. This is something that we can learn that wherever we pray, we exercise the name of Yeshua, the powerful, marvelous, wonderful, blessed name of Yeshua. And the demons will be subjected to this powerful name. But hear what Yeshua mentioned, said to them. Totally <laughs> offline, you know. Here he's talking about, uh, uh, they were so happy talking about they have uh, power over demons, but Yeshua all of a sudden switched channel. And he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heavens. Now this is what Yeshua saw into the future. Amen. And he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, which is actually referring to the verse in chapter 12 of verse 9 where the dragon was cast out. Right? So this is how you can relate to what Yeshua said in something that will happen in the future. And when that happens, we'll know that all hell will break loose. All right? Then here he said, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpent and scorpion. Now this is such a powerful word that we need to appropriate into our spirit. We have been given the power to trample on serpents and scorpions and the power of the enemies, and nothing shall by any means hurt us. So therefore, do not rejoice that you can cast out demons, all right? but rejoice that your name are written in heaven. And I also believe that this is a warning for all of us, that we must appropriate the gift that has been given to us, the power that is within us, that is given to us to be able to be overcomers, and this understanding is so important because the time will come where Satan is cast out from second heaven onto earth. And this is the time where we will have to exercise this gift that we have, the power that's within us, so that we can continue to be overcomers and not to fall into the trap of the devil and lose our salvation. That's why when we can remember this power that's given to us, we will be overcomers and we will not lose our salvation. And that's why Yeshua mentioned in this verse 20, he said, rejoice because when you are the overcomers, your name and my name will be written in heaven. Amen. And I think this is a verse that can talk about present and also talk about the things to come in the future. All right. So this is so powerful. And now here, verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of God, the power of Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cut down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. I want to pause here for a moment. A time will come. In fact, it has already come in many other nations that many believers are being put to the test and that they overcame the persecutor. They overcame the, their persecutors by the appropriating the blood of the Lamb, by what Yeshua has accomplished on Calvary and on the cross and by the testimony of their, of their, of their, of their exploit for the kingdom. And when they testify, they're so powerful. And the last thing is that they not only testify what Yeshua has done in their life and through their life, but they also love not their life unto death. So they're talking about martyrdom. So here, my brother and my sister, do not lose your inheritance. Do not lose your reward. And I also remind myself and my wife that we must not fear death and we must not give up our uh, allegiance to 
uh, Yeshua and Abba Father, and we must always be thankful for the love that has shown us that he sent Yeshua to die for us. And here is a very sober reminder that we need to be firm in our faith. We need to be strong in our endeavor. We need to soldier on and to go and to do great exploit because we know who we are. We are his sons and we are his daughters. Yeah. Just a reminder, Jesus said he's coming back soon and his reward is with him. That is in the Revelation chapter 22. Three times he mentioned, surely I'm coming back quickly. Behold, I'm coming back quickly. And one of them, he said, I mean, you check, it's uh, verse 7, verse 12, and verse 20 of the book of Revelation chapter 22. Yeah. The last chapter, three times he yeah. mentioned. Right. So when it, in the Bible, if mention one is important, when mention two is very, very important, yeah. and mention three times is super important. Yeah. Okay, so take note, Jesus said he's coming back very soon. And that's why he sent Robert Mawari, sent so many people to forewarn us. So when they are discouraged, I will encourage every one of us to read Revelation chapter two and three, which is the letters to the seven churches. And each church mentioned in Revelation two and three, there's a wonderful promise for overcomer. Amen. And I must stress, it's overcomers only. So if you are afraid, if you are fearful, and you deny Jesus uh, in front of others, Jesus said he will deny you in front of his Father and his angels. Amen. So do not make a, a, a sort of... A, What's a poor exchange? Okay, Jesus has paid the price for us so that we can be reconciled with Father God and enter into his kingdom and be called his adopted as his sons and daughters. So don't give up your, Amen. your position. And uh, because we we are what just for forewarning you because satan is so angry because he knows his time is short Amen. and persecution is coming it's already here in some country and uh, even in israel persecution is coming because if you do not take the injection you will be be not given some privileges to 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 go into certain places yeah. and it's just the beginning Amen. Okay. Don't go through the rabbit holes because there's so many other okay. things. <laughs> we, we, have, we have an agenda to follow. And over here, I just want to uh, reinforce what uh, Christine had mentioned. In chapter 22, there are three mentioned that uh, he's coming quickly. Uh, chapter 22, verse 7, yeah. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the word of the prophecy of this book, similar to what is done in chapter 1. What? And then again, in, chap in sure. verse uh, Verse, um, verse 12. 12, he says again, And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me. He's talking about reward. Yeah, reward. To give to everyone according to his works. And then write down all the way to the verse 20 of chapter 22. The last two verses. Again, he emphasized, He who testify of these things says, Surely I'm coming quickly. So here, three mentions in just one chapter. The last chapter, which is, the very, finito, very yeah, which important. is the you know the epilogue, and uh, here it's just a reminder for us that Yeshua is coming back quickly. How soon we do not know because no one oh, knows because the Father is only one who knows, all right. And uh, we only know that maybe the the, the season, we know the season, but not the time. Yeah, not the date and the hour, yeah. but we know the season. Amen. So here, let's continue. Verse twelve. We say, therefore, O heaven, and you who dwell in them. Right, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the seas. Now, when they talk about inhabitants of the earth and the seas, this seas is actually denoting mankind. Uh, you know, these are the people that are left behind. These are those who have not been, uh, you know, uh, raptured uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the seventh trumpet. They will be here and, uh, well, they will, they will go through this uh, great uh, tribulation period. 
um, the devil has come down to you having great wrath because you know that he has a short time. All right, here, let's move on. Now, who is this woman that's persecuted, right? The, verse 13, now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the women. We mentioned that earlier that this woman is none other than uh, Israel, who gave birth to the male child. And, and the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. Now, just mention again, time and times and half a time is again referring to uh, the three and a half years. All right, the same period of time. So here he's talking about this period of time for three and a half years, this woman will be kept saved. Now in today's modern technology, uh, what uh, John saw was a great eagle, right? But in today's, uh, today's uh, 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 scene, uh, the great eagle is actually looking at uh, America. Right? America is uh, denoted by the land of the free, but the, one of the symbols there is uh, this uh, golden eagle, right? The great eagle. And here it may point to words that in the end times, America will have this great task is to do extreme uh, uh, help by airlifting the remnants of the messianic believers out from Israel into safety. The messianic believers, listen to this, they are not all the Jewish people. The, it's people, the Jewish people who believe in Yeshua, the messianic uh, 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 people will then be taken out as, as a representative of the women, which is Israel, will be airlifted up to a place of safety, into a place in the wilderness. Now over here, I just want to relate to you what happened in the past. In the same way, uh, in this um, case of uh, uh, where in 1870, where uh, the Roman uh, legions came and encircled uh, Jerusalem, and then Jerusalem fell in AD 70. Uh, some of the rabbi actually recorded that uh, before this took place, the Messianic believers actually left Jerusalem sometime before this took place and took refuge uh, in the, uh, the, uh, the desert. And we believe that this is the place called Petra, which we visited in 2019 before the COVID started. <laughs> Thank God we went there. The <laughs> so here, uh, let's move on. And over here in Daniel 7, 4. Again, this is a, a new revelation that we learned from uh, Robert, uh, Prophet Robert. Uh, refers to Daniel 7, 4. Let me read to you. First, there was a lion uh, and then he had eagle wings. Now, when this lion uh, uh, was first mentioned with eagle wings, is referring to Great Britain. Now, their motive of uh, uh, in England that there is this lion with wings, and uh, this actually denotes the great empire of Great Britain. And then the second part of this verse, I watched till his wings were plucked off. So when it means that the wings are plucked off, means Great Britain or the Great Empire has uh, diminished its uh, influence in the world. All right, that means its influence in the world is over with. And that's where it could not uh, exercise its influence by flying around. So it is being now more landed, more grounded. And that's where uh, England is where today. And um, out come uh, another lion. And we know that this lion is none other than the United States of America. Uh, it was called the young lion all right, in uh, Psalm 91. A young lion, and it was lifted up from earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. So how do we know that this is USA? Because another very important uh, motive, a very important uh, sig uh, emblem of America is Uncle Sam. <laughs> Uncle Sam, in this photo, you see that uh, uh, this is a man, you know, with uh, the colors of the United States of America, with the stars and the stripes, and he's a man standing on two feet. So from this verse alone, we know that it made reference to the United Kingdom, uh, Great Britain, and the Empire of Great Britain, and also refers to uh, USA. All right, so here we know that uh, when we talk about the last verse here, that given two wings of an eagle. This eagle is referring to none other than the nation of America who will be taking part in this uh, protection of the remnants 
the Messianic community that will bring them out into safety by airlifting them into the place of refuge. And here, verse 15. So the serpent sprew water out of his mouth like a flood after the women, and he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the women, and the earth opened his mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spilled out of his mouth. Now over here, uh, we take it literally that uh, the serpent spilled water. Now this is not water in a natural sense. The water in scripture refers to mankind. Here when the serpent spilled out the water, he's talking about those people which, who are under his control, right? under his demonic influence. They will come out. And there will be hordes of them that come out and uh, they try to come and uh, to stop the, uh, uh, the remnants, uh, the messianic remnants to run away. Uh, but a miracle is going to happen. The earth is going to open up and literally open up. You know, this is a sinkhole that I show you. Uh, look how deep it is. It's a sinkhole. And uh, you can just swallow up those uh, people that were going after the remnants that are running away. Uh, from persecution in Israel. So here, this verse here, spill water, refers to uh, those uh, people who are under the influence and control of the dragon and after the uh, messianic uh, remnants that were fleeing from uh, Israel during that time and period. All right. So here, how do I make reference to this? Is it mentioned in the Old Testament? Of course. It's mentioned in the Old Testament in number 16, verse 30 to 33, regarding uh, Korah, which is the tribe from Levi, and uh, Nathan and uh, Abiram, which is from the tribe of Reuben. Now, these three individuals uh, incite many of the uh, Israelites to go against Moses and uh, Aaron. And the Lord was so angry with them, you know. And uh, so this is what happened recorded in verse 30 to 33. Let me read. But if the Lord create a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth and swallow them up, all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. So in the same spirit, when we look at the verse uh, that we uh, just referred to uh, in the previous slides about the serpents and his cohorts of uh, followers, they will be swallowed, uh, they will be uh, uh, swallowed up alive when the earth opens up as in the days of uh, 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 Moses, you know. So what has happened in the past is a foretaste of what is going to happen in the future. So verse 31, now it come to pass as he finished speaking all these words, that the ground split apart and under them and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, just like this uh, sinkhole that you see here. And every horde of uh, wickedness and people that were against the messianic remnants will be caught and down alive into the pit, all right? And so it is so, so really uh, scary, you know? So they and all those who with them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed over them and they perished from among the assembly. So this is the thing that we're going to see, you know, when we're coming to uh, the remaining uh, days before uh, Yeshua returns. So here, scripture already pre warned us of what is to come. So when we see all these things, uh, we say, aha, we know it, we know it, we know it's to come, and we are preparing ourselves uh, to receive the Lord. So this will add comfort to us because we know scripture and we know what is to come so that we will not be caught unaware. And here, the saints will be persecuted and during the wrath of the dragon. Verse 17 of Revelation 12. And the dragon was enraged with the women and because the women now is kept safe, the, the remnants, uh, the messianic remnants are kept safe for three and a half years. And he went to make war with the rest of the offspring. That means the Gentiles who are the believers, all right? We who believe in Yeshua, who keeps the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So has this happened in the past? Yes, it has happened in the past. So you see over here uh, in this uh Majestic uh, uh, Colosseum, you have, uh, you know, the lions there waiting to devour this group of believers that group together and in their death, they do not love their life unto death. So here, what has happened in the past uh, will again happen in the uh, 
foreseeing future. All right, so let's look at what happened not too long ago. And let's remember that uh, what happened in the past is also a signal for us to know that what is to come. Now, Adolf Hitler has been uh, attributed to be uh, the foreshadow of Antichrist. In fact, many of the things that he has done is uh, really a, a type of uh, Antichrist. He invaded Austria uh, on March 11. It was a very swift invasion of Austria, unprovoked. And uh, when he invaded Austria, it brought him to power. So that was in 1938. And uh, at the end of the war, uh, I believe he committed suicide. He died on April 30th, 1945. And when you look at the period in which he basically go against the people of God, not, not only just the Jews, you know, even the Christians, he murdered them, but of course his focus is to uh, eliminate the Jewish race. So here is a seven years of horror. So here it could not be a coincidence. You look at that. This is a foreshadow of what is to come when we talk about the seven years of tribulation. It's actually the seven years of the wrath of the dragon against God's people. And all of this, there will be three and a half years and three and a half years uh, of horror. In the last three and a half years is the most intensive, which is what we call the Jacob's uh, sorrow, which is uh, called the uh, Great Tribulation. My wife corrected me, Jacob's trouble. All right, so here, immediately after uh, the seven years, right, where uh, the persecution of Jewish people were over, you have this uh, United Nations born in the midst of despair in October 1945, just immediately after the end of World War II. And so this again is a pattern to show us that when the seven and a half, seven years is over, that immediately will usher in this uh, period of uh, millennium period. So uh, it is the midst of despair and uh, Yeshua will come and he will not be like the United Nations leaders. He will rule with righteousness. Amen. And there was no gall, no, no deceit in his, uh, his ruling. So here you can see the pattern of uh, Antichrist and then uh, seven years of tribulation and then the new world government, which is in the natural realm, but in the spirit realm, we will also have the same pattern that will come hopefully in our lifetime. All right, let's now move on to a next topic about the um, parables of the fig tree. All right, the revelation of what this fig tree comes into play. Now, in Matthew 24, which is a very important chapter that talks about end times in particular, uh, in verse 32, now let me read. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches or branch has already become tender and put forth leaves, you will know that summer is near. Summer. Now, these are the words of uh, Yeshua, yes, right? And uh, it is marked in red in my Bible, and so is yours. And uh, verse 33, so you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Ha <laughs> ha, it's so near. Uh, surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but right. my word will by no means pass away. Now, I want to unpack, unpack some of the words here. First of all, I want to unpack the word, the fig trees. Now, the fig tree denotes the nation of Israel, all right? It denotes the, Israel, the nation of Israel. And here you have an imagery of uh, the fig tree with full of leaves, but no figs yet. All right. So when the branch has already become tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is near. And so now we are enjoying this period of summer. But then verse 33, you say that when you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. That means this is a great sign that when Israel, represented by the fig tree, becoming a nation again, all right, when the branches have become tender. And in fact, when Israel became a nation, many other nations have gained independence, including our nation, Singapore. Amen. Right, we became independent after Israel became a nation. And many other nations have become independent nations. So here it is a symbol of Israel that coming to uh, fruitation and it brings forth uh, leaves. And we know that summer is near and know that 
it is near at the door, meaning that Yeshua is returning back. Yeshua is coming back for the bride. And then forth, I declare and I decree for those who hear us and those who zoom in today, that you will internalize the importance to know that the summer is near and Yeshua is returning back for you as the bride. And you must keep yourself holy pure. and pure and holy and, and know him through the love of the word. And here he say, surely, Jesus say that, surely I say to you, this generation, now what he meant by this generation is the Christ generation. Now if you really were to study the, the, the uh, gospel of Matthew, which talk about genealogy of uh, Jesus, you'll find that it is every 14 generation, 14 generation, and up to the last one, which is the 14th generation when you actually ordered them, it is silent and that generation is known as the Christ generation. All right, let me read up to you in Matthew chapter 1 verse 17. All this generation from Abraham to David are 14th generation and from David until the captivity in Babylon are 14th generation and from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14th generation. So if you really do a word study on the generation that comes and you'll find that to be the 14th generation is known as the Christ generation which is our generation now in this particular way the generation is not 40 years all right or not your lifespan you know but the generation who knows that Yeshua is the Lamb of God and Yeshua has come to redeem you and I and Yeshua is our Lord and our Savior. So we are known as the Christ generation. So in this particular verse here, I unpacked for you that when Jesus says, surely I say to you, this generation is referring to the Christ generation. It could be your father, your forefathers who have known Jesus. And because Jesus have come 20,000 years ago, and this period of time, the 20,000, uh, 2,000 years ago, this period of time is where we are known as the Christ generation generation. So here it says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will by no means pass away. And henceforth, he emphasized that this is so important that heaven and earth will surely pass away. But what Yeshua has declared about the parables of the fig tree will not pass away until we see fruitation, until we see the fulfillment of this powerful and illustrative parable. Let's move on. The nation is born in one day, all right, and which is talk about the fig tree. In May 14, 1948, this is a historical uh, proclamation by the Palestine Post that the state of Israel is born. Hallelujah. And this is what Jesus refers to, or Yeshua refers to, as the parable of the fig tree. And when the branch has become tender and put forth its leaf, that is where Israel is born again on May 14, 1948. And this date actually set the Messianic clock ticking. And every year is coming to a nearer time for the return of Yeshua as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. And this, and this dispensation of grace, as explained by Prophet Robert Mawari, starts from Jesus' baptism on uh, at uh, 26 AD. So that's why plus 2,000 years, it will end in 2026. So the time is very near. Wow, isn't it very, very near? 2026, and now we are 2021. 35 more years to go. All right, let's move on with a uh, higher spirit. Uh, historical pointers. Uh, let's look at the reference in Isaiah 66 verse 8 that actually talks about the birth of this nation. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such a thing? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Notice the word here. Or shall a nation be born at, at once? And look at this. No coincidence. Greatly in bold letters, the state of Israel is born. And referring to Isaiah 66 verse 8, a nation be born at once. Hallelujah. 
So here, this is a historical. Years. This is a historical photo <coughs> uh, of the um, declaration of the new state of Israel in 1948. Now let's look at uh, Ezekiel 37, particularly 7 to 10. This is referring to the dry bones, and Ezekiel was asked by the Lord to prophesy to the dry bone. And let me read verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded. This is Ezekiel speaking. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews, sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over. But there was no breath in them until verse 9. Also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man, and say to the breath, thus said the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on this slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. So here we had just uh, before the birth of uh, Israel as a nation again, we have uh, the Holocaust of 6 million Jewish people were slain and the bones were crying out. And so this prophet Ezekiel prophesied so many years ago that these dry bones will come forth again okay. and they will breathe and there will be an exceedingly great army. That's what we see today. The Israel okay. Defense Force, all right? Yeah. The IDF is such a powerful army with uh, great uh, weaponry and advanced uh, military uh, uh, techniques of uh, maneuverability. Yeah. And here, this is a very powerful verse in verse 14 of Ezekiel 37. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. You see, talking about uh, IDF. They indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, and cause you to come up from your graves, and bring you into the land of Israel. Now we are seeing that in our lifespan, lifetime. We are seeing the return of the Jewish people from all nations. And I believe this Aliyah movement will be accelerated much more <laughs> as more anti-Semitism coming out from the nation that will force the people, particularly the Jewish people from New York, they will come back in hordes back into the land of the forefathers. I will bring you into the land of Israel. Verse 13. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land then you shall know that I, the Lord, has spoken it and perform it, say the Lord. Now, I want to emphasize verse 14. Why did the Lord say, I will put my spirit in you? Why is it that I will put my spirit in you and you shall live, of course? But he didn't talk about that I will make me known to you, but I put my spirit in you. And henceforth, I want to refer you to uh, this wonderful chapter of Isaiah 11.2. Isaiah 11, 2 talks about the sevenfold spirit of God. It talks about the spirit of God. It talks about the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of understanding. It talks about the spirit of counsel and the spirit of might and the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of fear of God. Now, this prophecy uh, that was declared that God will put his spirit into this land where he brought back his people and this spirit will be the sevenfold spirit that gave the Israelis wisdom and understanding of how to do things. That's why they're becoming a startup nation. That's why today Israel is so technologically advanced. All right, and they fear God, but they fear God of all kinds of God. They do not just fear the God of Jehovah. They fear all kinds of God. That's why the spiritism in Israel is so prevalent. You know, that the people are looking, looking, looking for God, looking at God for many other places, going into the spirituality, you know, into the... Um, uh, Eastern culture, and they're seeking, they're seeking God. And here, oh here, um, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of God 
you know, that's why make uh, this is a startup nation. So here we can see the power of uh, scripture coming into play where you get to understand from these various angles that I've been sharing with you. Now over here, in Mark chapter 11, verse 12 to 14, uh, the fig tree withered. I want to emphasize that uh, this is again Yeshua's word. Uh, he came to Bethany and he was hungry and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves. That's why you see this picture of uh, a fig tree here. And he could find some, and, and he went to see if perhaps he could find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat the fruit from you again. Now there is some powerful spiritual uh, truth in this um, word of Yeshua. Now he came to um, to see this uh, fig tree, right? He went to see this fig tree, and this fig tree has leaves. So now we know that when the leaf become the branches become tender, and you see leaves, it's where the nation of Israel was born again, all right? But then he found that there's no fruit, even though it's not the season for fig, right? The it's not the season for fig, but there is no fruit now. Why is it that Yeshua expect fruit where there is no season at all. He expects us, particularly the land of Israel, to be the kingdom of priests, to be a holy nation, to be the one that brings the covenant of God to the nations of the world, to be the light of the world. That's why when he found that now the fig trees have become uh, green new leaves, and yet the people are not fulfilling the mandate that was given to them to be the light in the hill, to be light to the, the light to the Gentiles, and to be the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the bringing the gospel to the nation. So because there is no fruit, even though there was not the real season for figs to come, and that's why he said, let no one eat the fruit from you again. So here we find that this is again something that uh, what we are seeing today, Israel is still a very high ground. Uh, the number of Messianic believers are still very small. And uh, the government of Israel is still, uh, you know, controlled very much by the uh, Orthodox uh, Jews. And they were, they're not able to, uh, uh, you know, encourage people to recognize that Yeshua is the Messiah. Right? So here, uh, this is the reason why Jesus curse the tree. We have, um, I did some research on the characteristics of fig, and this is something very interesting that I found. You know, we normally think that uh, when the fruit is ripe, like durian, right? <laughs> Our favorite fruit, the king of fruits. When durian is ripe, is ripened, it will fall from the tree, but not so for the fig. All right, the fig actually uh, only matures from the branch. If you were to take the fig out before it's ripened, is not edible, all right. So it reminds us of this verse from John 15, where Jesus said, "I'm the the vine, vine and and, and uh, you yeah, know you are the branches, right? And you must uh, abide in me, and uh, unless you abide in me, you will bear no fruit, right?" In John 15, verse four to eight, right. So the fig only mature when it remains in the branches, and only when it fully matures, then you. Pluck it and then you can enjoy the sweetness of the fig. But if you were to pluck it too prematurely out of the branch, it will not, it will not mature. So here, when the fig falls, they do fall. And when they fall, it's because of lack of nutrients. And most of all, the fig will fall from the fig tree prematurely because of lack of water. Hallelujah. This was one of my aha moments when I was studying this, preparing for this uh, sharing, that uh, the reason why the fig falls in subsequent verses is because they lack the Spirit of God. You know, they lack the Spirit of God in here. So here in Mark 11, 20 to 24, when Jesus returned back, and this is what uh, Peter noticed, right? Uh, he says, uh, now in the morning, they passed by and they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots since uh, Yeshua cursed it. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Now, listen to this. 
Verse 22, Jesus did not answer his question directly, but he's answering in a much more deeper way of a lesson that he wanted Peter and his disciple to learn. Not just because of what he see in the natural, that the tree, because he cursed it, has withered away, but more so of the inner and deeper meaning to this uh, object lesson is that Jesus said, you must have faith. You must have faith in God that whatever God said to Israel, you are the nation, that uh, <clears throat> a holy nation. You are the uh, royal priesthood. You have to bring the gospel to the to the nations of the world. You are the light in the hill. And all these things, God has already pronounced it through Abraham. And yet, the Jewish people do not understand because they lack the faith in believing what God has told them, that their mandate to the nation is to be a holy nation and to be a royal priesthood. And that is the lesson that Yeshua wanted his disciples to learn. And I think Peter didn't catch it. And here, that's why Yeshua mentioned verse 22 and 21, there seems to be a disconnect, but it is not a disconnect. Yeshua wanted to bring the deeper understanding to his disciple of this example, this uh, object lesson of the fig tree. It's deeper than that, that you must have faith in God of what he has promised the nation of Israel, and you have not have faith to do what has been given to you as your right to be the holy nation, and the royal priesthood. So for actually, I say to you, whoever say to this mountain, that's why it's talking about faith, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believe and those things he say will be done and he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever thing you ask when you pray, believe you receive them and you will have them. So I want to pause here for a minute. I want to declare that let faith arise. Some of you here may have ailments, all right? Some of you may have uh, exenia. Some of you may have other problems that uh, only you know and God knows. But here, let your faith arise. I speak into your faith. Let your faith arise. And whatever you ask in the name of Yeshua, believe that you have received your healing. Believe that you have been restored back. Whatever that has been lost, you have been received back thousandfold, and you will have them. So I speak faith. Faith arise to everyone that listen in, and let it be so. Thank you, Abba. Thank you, Father, for giving us the faith. In Yeshua's name, Amen. Everyone says Amen. Amen. Especially for Pauline. Yeah. All right. Okay, yeah. So why did the fig fruit fall, right? This I mentioned already. But in this particular verse in Isaiah 34, all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved. Now, this is a prophecy by Isaiah. All right, all, all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heaven shall be rolled up like a scroll. All these hosts shall fall down as the leaf fall from the vine. Now, this is a very important uh, aha moment again also. So when the time comes, all right, where the, where the great tribulation is here, you'll notice that all the hosts will fall down. That means the, the fallen angels will come down. And then here it mentioned, as the leaf fall from the vine, now, this is something that's distinctively different from the fig tree. When the vine, the grapes, are ripened, and then the grapes are harvested, and then the leaf falls. <laughs> All right, let me say that again. When the grapes are ripened, and they are harvested from the vine, then after the harvest, the leaf will then fall. So here, you understand the physical significance and you put it into the spiritual realm, it will tell you that those who have the Spirit of God, the, 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 the wine that represents the Spirit, and you will be harvested. And then after that, the leaf falls. And then as the fruit falling from a fig tree, this means that those people who are evil, who do not have the Holy Spirit, a lack of water, which is the Spirit of God, all right, and lack of nutrient, which is fed by the word of God. They are like the fig that falls down from the tree because they are deemed to be diseased. And these are the ones that will be uh, left behind. So here, I want to emphasize that when we study scripture, we need to use our spiritual eyes to look into the physical realm and what it tells us 
And um, from there, we draw out deeper understanding as what I have shown you in this particular verse. So here, when we talk about the leaf falls from the vine, it means that the grapes has been harvested already. Those who are in the Lord and have the Spirit of God will be harvested, and then the leaf from the vine will fall. At the same time, the fig tree, uh, the figs will also fall because these are the ones that do not have sufficient water and nutrients based on the Word of God. So here, this is the significance of this verse. All right, here, that's why I was going to allude to this part and my wife interrupted me. So this is the sixth seal. All right, the sixth seal talks about um, Revelation 6. Again, referring to the same thing, we look at the previous verse in Isaiah um, 34 verse 4. And uh, similarly, it parallels to uh, the book of Revelation. It talks about the host of angels or the stars of heaven or the fallen angels will fall to earth as the fig tree drop is lake figs. Now the lake figs means it is towards the end of the end. All right. And the fig tree which denotes Israel. All right. And still there are figs there. There are Israelis people that are so hardened that do not have the spirit of God and they will fall by the wayside. And the shaking by the mighty wind which is the, you know, the, the, the wind of uh, destruction and the sky will recede as a scroll when it rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of place similarly to Isaiah 34 verse 4 as mentioned there the heavens will be rolled up like a scroll so here you see the parallel between the Old Testament and the New Testament the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed all right I say that again the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. That means all those things that's coming will be concealed in the Old Testament. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Hallelujah. All right, so the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And here we can have see this parallel between uh, connecting the Old Testament and uh, the New Testament. And then we have a much more uh, complete picture of what Abba Father wants to tell us. All right, so that leads us to the end of this sharing, uh, which is the Yeshua is returning back for the millennium period. Hallelujah. And uh, again, I just want to emphasize, I want to thank those who have just recently uh, subscribed to my channel. Uh, I want to encourage uh, all of you to come and do that. You can actually go to my YouTube channel, Yehu Chan YouTube. And then over here at the right hand bottom, there is a subscription button. You just click onto it. And I want to say that you don't have to wait until the end of the, of the video to do that. At any point in time, uh, watching the video, even the first few minutes, you can still subscribe, right? And um, just click on the thumbs up. Yeah, that's right. If you enjoyed this video, do subscribe by pressing this button below. You'll be the first to be informed of any posting that I make. Shalom, goodbye.